This is a download from the outdoorstation.co.uk. You're listening to the tale of three podcasters walking across Scotland during the 30th anniversary of the RAB TGO Challenge. Part 10. This podcast is just one from a special series produced from a wealth of recordings made in May 2009 during the 30th anniversary of the RAB TGO Challenge. Recording the event were Andy Howell, Shirley Worrell and me, Bob Cartwright. We were just three of the 360 or so challengers who were walking the unsupported 200 miles from the west to the east coast of Scotland. This was the 30th year of the event, sponsored by RAB and, of course, TGO Magazine, who have been behind the challenge ever since its inception in 1980. The framework and principle is totally unique. It isn't a race or competition of any kind. The objective is to foster good fellowship amongst walkers within the framework of a challenging 200-mile expedition. This is a backpacking trip, and everyone carries what they need for the duration, picking up the occasional food parcel along the way. The start consists of a series of sign-out locations on the west coast, anywhere from Torridon in the north down to Ardrishaig in the south. Each challenger, solo, couple or group, makes their way via a high route, a low route or the mixture of the two across Scotland to finish anywhere between Arbroath and Fraserburgh on the east coast. There's a set two-week window to do this in and each participant submits their route for inspection prior to departure for safety and advice reasons. The places are normally limited to 300. However, on this 30th anniversary, this was increased to 360. Details about the future events, entry forms, past stories and photographs can be found in the October issue of TGO magazine. Plus, in recent years, there's an ever-growing online library of podcasts, diaries and blogs from numerous challenges dotted around the web. Each participant makes the challenge as easy or as hard as they wish. The extremes can be a remote high route, carrying everything you need, navigating your way across wild country, taking in the magic vista which only Scotland can offer, and not seeing another soul for days on end. Or a route taking in the many social meeting places, not camping at all and using established warm, dry accommodation all the way. Most people do a mixture of the two in different forms. Depending on the ever-changing conditions, an event like this can throw at you. On this 30th anniversary, three of us took audio recorders with us to share our experiences and those of others we met along the way. Rose and I started from Oban, Andy Howell and his partner Kate from Torridon, and for the first time this year, Shirley Worrell was to give us a solo female perspective, also starting from Torridon. We were all aiming for different finish points on the East Coast via completely different routes. And so, this is our story. Well, hello. It's about almost half past ten on the morning of day twelve. And um, I'm tramping along the road from a place called Dinnert, where I stayed last night, um, back through, well, back towards a place called Millfield, and then in the general direction of um, Mount Battock, or Buttock, as I like to think of it, and Mount Keen, with the intention of camping either at Charbothy, well, sleeping in Charbothy, or camping at Tarside tonight. Went a little bit off route yesterday, um, and um, having started out with the intention of going up Mount Keen um, with Colin Ibbotson, um, the day developed into such a revoltingly wet and soggy day that we thought perhaps discretion should be the better part of valour and we should take a lower route. And we saw and we noticed an intriguingly named Half Mile Hut in a little forest on the map, not terribly distant. So we thought what we would do is drop the packs at uh, a little Sheelin thing um, that's, uh, I don't know, a couple of kilometres from the foot of Mount Keen. Drop the packs there, dash up, insofar as it's possible to dash up Mount Keen, and then dash down again, grab the packs, and make our way to this halfway hut in the hope that it might be similar to 
some of the really lovely shooting lodges that we saw while we were crossing the Mona Lea. Um, anyway, we took off the packs and immediately the heavens opened even wider than they'd been open before and it was absolutely sopping wet. And so we kind of thought, well, what on earth's the point of this? And so we put the packs on and decided to set out for the halfway hut. And we did, and it turned out to be a very nice little hut, but it was indeed only a hut, quite a small hut at that, not the sort of place you'd want to spend the night. So anyway, then we sort of continued thinking, oh, well, we'll just wait till we find a nice place to stop. But then it occurred to us that Alan Sloman had mentioned that he was staying at a nice hotel in dinner last night. And um, anyway, I had a bit of a chip fantasy, and once I had the chip fantasy, it proved impossible to dislodge it. And so therefore we decided we'd go there, um, because the map showed that there was camping. Sadly, though, it turned out that I was carrying an old copy of the map, so let this be a lesson to the rest of you carrying an old copy of the map. It's important to update them, because when we got there, it turns out the camping ended several years ago. There was no camping. So, stayed in the hotel in the end. That was very nice. A bit of an unexpected expense, but very comfortable. Yummy breakfast this morning. Free-range eggs, very nice with mushrooms. And um, anyway, so Colin's gone off along a cycle track today um, on what I think is his penultimate day. Um, a lot of road walking. I didn't like the idea of that. And so I'm heading back into the hills um, with the intention either of going to Tarside, which is where I was supposed to be tonight. And I'm very keen to be there. One, because I've never stayed at Tarside. And two, because Colleen Tock is going to be there. And Colleen was, of course, my very first veteran. The very the, the best Colleen, I don't know whether it's widely understood, is the best veteran in the world. And so I'm kind of keen to meet up with him if possible at Tarside tonight. But on the other hand, you know, I'm sort of reluctant to miss the possibility of an interview with a vampire down at Charbothy. So anyway, we'll see how it goes as the day passes. Um, it was absolutely beautiful first thing this morning, golden sunshine. But it's kind of died away a bit. I mean, I'm not really complaining because it isn't yet raining. Um, and it's, you know, it's quite comfortable. But I hope it doesn't become too, late, too wet later on. I've heard that it might do, but I'm st crossing my crewbins and hoping that it won't. So anyway, there we go. It's hard to believe that uh, I'm within a couple of days of finishing this year's challenge. The whole thing has just passed so incredibly quickly. It's really quite, um, well, as I say, it's very hard to believe. But there we go. That's how it is. So uh, I'll press on for now. Um, and later in the course of the morning, or perhaps when I get to uh, wherever it is I decide to go to, I'll provide another update. But in the meantime, I hope that uh, everybody else is enjoying their challenge. And uh, I'll speak later. It's about 10 to 11 on the morning of day 12. I just thought I'd record this for those of you who are never lost. Um, a sort of cry for help from those of us who are almost constantly lost. Uh, I seem to be doing absolutely fine with my map reading earlier on this morning. Um, in accordance with the uh, instructions I'd been given over the course of the last couple of days by Colin, who's a very good map reader. And uh, there was this really helpful hint about keep watching the map, which does seem to work. And I was doing fine with that until I started recording something on this dinky little machine, I don't know, half an hour ago. And um, anyway, I found that I was going wrong when suddenly the path disappeared and I, I just noticed in front of me what looked like some kind of sawmill. And I looked on the map and I saw that there is indeed a sawmill in completely the wrong direction. And so now I'm having to try to just aim south through um, bogs and goodness knows what and it's really kind of revolting. So uh, this is an opportunity for all of you uh, competent navigators to feel smug now. Um, because you can uh, you can sit there and listen into how it is for those of us who never have a bloody clue where we're going. Anyway, update later. Hopefully, I can find my way back onto the right path. Well, it's another day in Scotland and another torrential downpour. Um, we wandered down this morning from Tarfside to Edsall, uh, which is a, a lovely walk alongside the river. Uh, more people doing it than usual, I think, this time, because many people who are looking to go through the Fesseresso Forest, I think, are just not fed up with the rain and the, the bogs of the last few days. But, uh, in fact, it was torrential downpour most of the way. We all filed into the Tucking Cafe in Edsall, dried out a little bit, and hit the long road for North Waterbridge Campsite, where most of us are now ensconced. No sooner as we got here than the clouds have opened up again. Absolutely horrendous, horrendous weather. Um, 
just when you think there can't be any more rain in the cloud sky, it comes down. Yes, we um, we had a moment um, as we were walking out here. The sky seemed to be clearing. There was even some slightly blue sky. And fortunately for us, um, when we actually arrived, um, it was dry for about 20 minutes or half an hour. We got the tent up and it looked as though it was going to turn into a nice evening. But as you say, there's still more water in those clouds and it's coming down again. Yeah, well, we might get a chance to talk to some of the folks in their tents. That's if uh, we can actually get out. But uh, there you go, it's Scotland. And uh, you've got to expect these things. Still nearly the end now. And, uh, but, uh, well, would have been nicer to have had a better last week. As you've already heard, Andy had made his way via Edsel to North Water Bridge earlier that day. Shirley, on the other hand, was taking a special route known only to her to eventually join us at Tarfside. We, on the other hand, spent the entire day lazing on Tarfside playing fields, trying to alleviate the boredom, watching the rain and others arrive in various states of saturation. During a brief let-up in the rain, I did manage to catch up with first-timer Alastair Hunt and spoke to well-known outdoor blogger Darren Christie. Yeah, it's been a really good trip. I've really enjoyed it. There's been a lot... I put a lot of pressure on myself last year to complete. I enjoyed it last year, but this year has just been... It's been a ball. I've really enjoyed it, even with the bad weather we've had. So, bumping into people I met last year, people I already knew, it's been fantastic. You've um, gone relatively lightweight and taken a tarp, um, and of the ten nights I think we've had so far, you've used it for what, four or five? Yeah, I used it for four or five. Um, one of the nights was last Friday, which is quite bad weather. It stood up quite well compared to the tents as well. I was able to utilise a wall that the tent owners weren't able to give, give me a bit of extra protection. So, yeah, I think the t tarps held up quite well compared to the tents. Um, no problems with bugs and that type of thing? No no problems with bugs at all. Now, one thing I particularly want to, to chat to you about, because I know you're a, a blogger and you're um, an outdoor blogger and one of the, of the of the group of them and are very keen to get a signal and obviously update your blog as you go along. But in particular, you've been using the SatMap system. Uh, and how have you been actually using that with sort of your blogging and photography? Uh, I've been using the SatMap to track my walks each day, so I can... At the end of the day, I get stats to tell me exactly how far I've walked, and it records the exact path. Then when I get back, I can then tie up the file that's been recorded with my photographs, and it will be able to tag the photographs with the exact position that they were taken, and then I can feed that into a Google Map or Google Earth um, plug-in for my blog later when I get back, so people will be able to click on a link and see the photograph where it's exactly taken. What do you think the advantage of that is? Um... It's automating. I could do it all by hand, but it would take out, if you're taking two, three hundred pictures over the course of two weeks, that's an awful lot of time to do it manually, remembering where you took it and then putting all that information in, where you can just sync up this file with the timestamps on your photographs and it does it for you. It's, it, it's a time saver. So from a, a viewer that's viewing your, your blog or your information afterwards, it makes it easy for them to actually, if they were thinking of coming on the same route or part of the same route, they get a good idea of the, 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 what the terrain was like. Is that the type of thing? It would give them a good idea of what the terrain's like, what the views are like there, but it also allows them to get that information up a lot quicker than if I was doing it by hand. So the actual SatMap uh, unit itself, most people are aware of the, the sort of PDA type size uh, equipment that it is. Uh, obviously it's got, um, uh, well, what, what size maps have you got in there? I've got the whole of the UK at 1 in 50. Okay. Um, now presumably you have to have that switched on all the time for it to track where you do, you're going and, and obviously where you are. Yeah, it has to be switched on all the time. You can do little battery saving tricks like getting the screen to switch off after like 30 seconds. Um, only check where you're walking every three seconds and stuff like that and that and I've been getting about 24 hours on a set of three AA lithium batteries which is quite good uh, so it's 24 hours using and obviously yeah. that's presumably what about three days walking uh, approximately three days yeah yeah um, and a lithium battery is ex uh, expensive 
It depends where you get them. They can be. They can be up to twice as much as the regular AAs, but they last a hell of a lot longer. Well, um, regular AAs in a sat map last about six hours. So what I'm just trying to think, if it would, would it be possible, do you think, to actually have done this trip just using the sat map? Did you have maps as well? I had maps printed out for the route. Um, we had to go off our route because of weather conditions and stuff, so to get back on, we had to use the sat map and its maps to enable us to get back to our original plot uh, route, which was two days later. So yeah. I was able to plot the routes, work out rough estimates for distances and see a rough profile of the terrain all on the sat map, which was very handy. OK. Would you actually use it on its own without taking maps? No. Uh, I was forced to, out of necessity, for two, three days. Uh, it's a great tool to back up, and, but I'd still have maps, because you never know when those batteries are going to die. Yeah, absolutely. What about that last uh, last couple of days? We've had pretty particularly poor visibility and, and atrocious weather at times. Uh, have you found it really comforting to actually have that sort of switched on and wherever you had it in your pocket or, or pouch, just to confirm you were definitely where you thought you were? Uh, I've not been bothered with the poor visibility. It's been more the rain and the and going through forests and confirming just track positions. And it does give you, a, as you said, a bit more secu security as you know exactly... You just flick a button and you know exactly where you are on an OS map. So that's one piece of equipment. Now, from a blogging point of view, um, how have you actually typed up your, your notes for the day and uploaded that to, to your website? I've been using a little Windows smartphone. I've had a bit of technology breakdown there because I had to change plans literally one or two days before I came out on the challenge. So my biggest problem with keeping my little phone going is keeping it charged, which, thanks to Duncan... I've got a battery charger for it now that I'm able to keep it topped up, but yeah, it's just using a little smartphone with a little keyboard, screen flips up and you can type away. And when, and when it's, you finish typing, does it just literally upload to your, to your blog site? Uh, no, as soon as I get a fig signal, I can then sync it with my blog and it'll post them live onto the blog then in the correct order. No, that's very clever. Very clever and presumably the rest of the, the, uh, the clever technology is at the blog end rather than at the phone end. Uh, it doesn't, it's, doesn't really matter to, at the blog end because it's as far as it knows what I'm doing on the phone is the same as what I'm doing on the PC or from any other computer. So I'm, I'm just thinking about now for people perhaps who, who do trips that might to use say Flickr accounts or something like that and obviously want to blog their world trip wherever it might be not necessarily across Scotland um, could they manage just by occasionally getting to to uh, um, uh, an internet cafe, uploading the pictures, and then obviously if they were using a smartphone or something sim similar to actually attach the story to it and link the whole thing to the blogs. Is it that simple? It can be that simple. It depends on the so how sophisticated the software is on the mobile phone you're using. you definitely got to use a smartphone with either a keyboard or something like an iPhone. Um, but especially for putting for photos up, yeah, internet, PCs, there's been two or three of them around on the Challenge at Youth Hostels and stuff, and they're quite happy to lay it, quickly plug in a memory card to upload stuff. So, yeah, it really is that simple. OK, OK. Um, um, well, without going through loads of stuff then, uh, keeping it fairly brief, uh, got to be two questions. Worst bit of kit, best bit of kit? Freeloader, for me, has been the worst bit of kit. It's been a t technology breakdown for me that's meant I was struggling with the battery charger. And... Yeah, the sat map, as we've already discussed. I've been really, really impressed with the way that's been working. OK. And uh, your best memory and your worst memory? Best memory so far, I'd have to say getting into Braemar and seeing all my friends. And worst memory, probably getting up knowing I've got to walk into a storm and pitch my tarp into the bad weather <laughs> on last Friday. <laughs> it's hard to motivate yourself then. <laughs> Mm, further update, 11.01, I've emerged from the woods onto uh, what looks like some kind of sown field. Um, I'm still trying to head south, but I can't head directly south at the moment without going uphill through uh, a dense little birch forest, which looks to be liberally interspersed with all sorts of wire fences incorporating many yards of barbed wire. So anyway, I'm doing a sort of a long and then left a bit. So, uh, God, this is dispiriting. Wouldn't it be really nice of often thing to be one of those people who can sort of look at the map and kind of recognise where it is they want to be and just set out and get there, you know, 
without having to make all sorts of unanticipated detours and revisions and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, so I'm turning a little bit left now. Um, so we'll see what we get from here. Um, if things get really dire, then I'll open up the pack and get out the GPS. And that'll tell me where I am, I suppose. And, and maybe I can persuade it even to tell me where I ought to go. But for now, I'll see how I can get on with uh, with a very vague understanding of the map and the service of my trusty compass. OK, bye for now. Well, there have been moments today where the rain stopped for, ooh, five, six minutes and I managed to get an interview with uh, a couple of the guys here, or we managed to get out and stretch our legs and top up with water. But otherwise, we actually failed miserably to get down to the retreat for a slap-up lunch or breakfast or brunch or order our tea that we, we hoped to do. So it's been um, a good rest day in the sense that we've been forced to lie horizontal and doze. You've been very lazy and done very little, washed out a pair of socks and had a shower and potted about and... That's been it, really. Yeah, Tried spoke... to get stuff dry, too. Just spoke to a few people. Yeah, we've uh, dried a few bits of clothing, and uh, as you can hear, the weather is uh, as it is on the tent at the moment, and the campsite has emptied out in the morning, apart from us, and now filled back up again with probably about 20 or so Challenger's tents. Um, so we thought uh, we might as well take the opportunity, while it's raining again, to talk about gear for a short while. Now, we don't want to do... Um, a long gear review that we've done before because um, it can get a bit boring but we thought we'd just sort of choose a few select items that we'd wanted to chat about um, that have uh, made it uh, made the difference uh, for us on this trip um, now I suppose in all honesty we've actually got our gear that we use for something like this down to a fine art as regards our particular choices uh, such as you know particular down jackets and base layers and a, a spare a set of dry clothing and that sort of thing but there's been a few items which um, have proved themselves either to be new uh, or new to us that uh, we thought we'd um, spend a couple of minutes chatting about so uh, if you don't mind we'll, we'll have a bit of a gear chat first rose um, you've used a go light frameless rucksack the pinnacle for the first time what are your thoughts yeah I was, uh, i've been really encouraged I, i've always been a bit he hesitant about the uh, pinnacle but this year the, the new model with a bit more padding in the back and uh, added hip belts i thought yep I'll have a go with this hip belt pockets help yes hip belt pockets and uh, i really like it actually the only thing i still do miss i have to say is a top pocket but that's girls like pockets to organize things bags 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 and bags, bags but no it's it's, uh, it's been really comfy it's carried very easily and uh, i've been really pleased with it so uh, definitely um uh, a great bag. Look. And I think, uh, according to the uh, airport scales, with three days of food in it, you were carrying about eight, nine k. Yeah, about eight, 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 nine k. Yes. Yeah. So a good, yeah, uh, good. Yeah, got some food in. Actually. Yeah, good balanced load. Um, I, for a change, um, I normally take the Pinnacle, but uh, this time I took a um, light speed, a Go Light light speed, which is their fifty liter pack. Um, it's heavier than the Pinnacle, it's a framed pack, uh, but I particularly wanted to get the capacity down to 50 litres uh, and uh, reduce the, the bulk of the items I, I was carrying, uh, which was important. And the actual rucksack has been incredibly comfortable uh, and, um, I wouldn't say watertight, but certainly very water-resistant. On to uh, other new items that we've tried. Uh, what about yours? You've got some, some new clothing? Yeah, I've uh, used the Superfly before, which I love. Uh, super event jacket by Montaigne. Um, and I thought, really, I ought to try something else. And I did consider my Paramo Alto 2 jacket, but it was just a bit heavy. <laughs> so I, um, I've gone for a Venture jacket, ladies' Venture jacket, and the Venture trousers because uh, the waterproof trousers I got were some old ones and the zips only went as far as the knee, which they were great, but they just I couldn't get them on over my boots when it was raining. So um, Venture trousers, the waterproof trousers, fantastic. The zips go right up the thigh, um, been out in horrendous weather and it's been absolutely fabulous. And the jacket too uh, has been superb, um, slightly cheaper than the Superfly. The only thing that um, I have seriously missed is a chest pouch pocket, and I really have missed that. Um, and once my rucksack's on, it's very difficult to access the pockets in the jacket. So um, waterproofness has been fantastic. As I say, I have actually 
quite miss that chest pocket, pocket particularly. And I think on a, another note, it, it's very tailored. It looks very good on oh, you. thank you, Dan. You've looked very smart. Oh, thank and you. in fact, other people have commented <laughs> how smart you've looked, <laughs> uh, which I think is uh, a most important part. Uh, on, on my um, on my waterproof, I've um, had the this year's Superfly jacket, uh, which has been um, very good. Uh, slight improvements to the previous one I had was they've got a, a, a chest um, uh, you, uh, what do you call it? Chest cord, so that you can tailor the jacket more to your chest and pull the cord inside your your side pockets, which is um, uh, makes it look nice. I like to look smart if I can on the hill. No, you look very smart. Uh, thank sweetheart. you very much indeed. And it has been mentioned. <laughs> it has been mentioned. Bright <laughs> um, red it is, Bob's. Yes, by the way, thank you very red. much. Um, but the only thing I think that needs a bit of work is the uh, cuff Velcro tabs. Um, the tabs that you obviously flip over to the cuff when you lock the cuff down before you put the gloves on when it's raining. Uh, it's got a very, very thick um, plastic uh, on the tab itself. It's quite stiff and it doesn't curve round the wrist. So consequently, when you slide your gloves on, it tends to catch it and it uh, pops open again, which uh, proves to be a bit of a pain in the neck when you're um, in the sort of weather conditions we were in the other day uh, and water's going everywhere and you want to strap it down. So uh, I think that needs a little bit of looking at. I probably need to take a lighter to it, I think, and melt the plastic a bit to to make it curve um uh waterproof trousers my good old faithful um berghouse pack light trousers i've had for years which uh, have done the job nicely was walking in um in innovate 315s and um, they've been uh, exceedingly good as per normal um uh, the gaiters i was using i've used the same gaiters i've used before the raid light gaiters um, now, the previous raid light gaiters I had, I gave away to a friend uh, in a moment of generosity, which were a fantastic fit, no problem at all. Um, I took these new raid light gaiters straight off the off the shelf, as it were, and I didn't try them on until halfway uh, through the walk or when I needed them, and realised that the raid light gaiters have actually been made too small. And I'm not too sure if raid light are aware of this, but um, I, I find it nigh on impossible to get the gaiter over my ankle. Uh, which is ridiculous considering the um, normal size feet that most people using those gaiters will be uh, considering. So I need to have a word with um, with the distributors and Raid Light about that because I think that's a, a, a manufacturing error that's crept in somewhere along the line. Well, it's also not just because your um, ankle was swollen. <laughs> no, it's, it's just generally far too small. It's, it's a, almost a lady's fit, which is ridiculous. Um, now, let's just have a quick chat about things which have been really, really impressive. I want to talk about the Neo Air. <laughs> Yeah, I've got some complaints about the Neo Air. Well, my Neo Air has been incredibly comfortable. Um, I've got the short Neo Air. Um, it, we slept on all sorts of ground, as you would do normally. And uh, for the one night that I <laughs> reluctantly let Rose, have a, <laughs> let Rose have a go with it, um, realised just how warm it was compared to the um, ProLite 3 Short that we normally use. Um, so very good, um, packs down incredibly small, very light uh, and much more durable and silent uh, than some people have sort of may have mentioned before because it, uh, I thought it was going to be a bit more squeaky as it were but actually it's been very very good on all counts apart from one which is that when you just sit on it as opposed to lie on it your backside goes right through it to the floor uh, and um, consequently you can feel the cold come through the, the floor or obviously the whatever's on the floor at the time or if you just lean on it, your elbow, uh, you go right through it uh, whereas if you lie on it, it's actually very, very comfortable. Uh, Rose's uh, complaint... Uh, I was going to say, I actually, there is two things that are not so, so good. One is because I'm on the, the thin, smaller, less comfortable, according to Bob, Thermarest, which actually I think is fine. Um, I am a lot lower than him, so if I snuggle up and want to put my head on his shoulder, it just falls off because he's much higher than me. There might be more information than people need to know. <laughs> I know, but it's quite crucial. So I think the only so solution is um, is really for me to have an EOA as well. Uh, well, unfortunately, that was the last one in stock. I know, and you managed to bring it with you. <laughs> Strange that. Yeah. Um, uh, items that have been surprisingly impressive, I would say uh, the Crocs, the or oh, the Croc replicas we've got. Um, I have been very impressed on just how much they uh, give your foot something else to work with as regards a bit of massage as it were um, when you get to the camp how quick and easy they are to slip into your feet and when you nip out to the loo uh, and also how light they are the, the downside being they're incredibly bulky to pack inside the rucksack but um, I have managed it with mine but you've had yours clipped on the back yeah yeah uh, it's quite interesting because we saw Martin Banfield about two or three years ago with them on the back when they were just sort of coming in um, and I was very sceptical about them, but uh, I sort of picked up my canoe shoes before we came and picked up my, 
the Crocs and thought, actually, the Crocs are so much lighter. And, the, and Beth and I have used them for the river crossings, no problem at all. Mm. So really very good. versatile and cheap, really cheap. Yeah, I think they cost I think us it's... five or ten quid, yeah. these, these things. So if you can get a pair of those, it's well worth it. Um... Luxury items. I, my um, poetry book, I, I always bring a slim volume, which I, I've read through a couple of times when we've had some early camps, as uh, this year being Kathleen Jamie, uh, recommended by one of our customers, Bobby McDonald, who, um, who, uh, having listened to previous podcasts, said, oh, have you heard of her? And I said, no. So uh, the girls actually bought me a very slim volume of The Tree House for Christmas, and I've uh, enjoyed reading that, as I say, odd, odd moments. Um, things that um, uh, have also worked would be the new Primus windshield. That's done the job fantastically, as it should do, really. Uh, the only thing I did do is I took a very fine file to some of the edges on it and made sure the edges were really smooth, uh, just in case it rubbed against any material, because there was a slight roughness to it. Um, but that was the, the minor thing. Um, the, you've got the tea light mugs and normal mugs we use. We've got, got pot cozies, which have all worked very well with our dehydrated food. Dried food's been good. Um, I think the thing that I've uh, brought, which I didn't really need, I've never used um, and could quite happily uh, forget, was my gorilla pod. Um, I was hoping to get some group photos and... Um the practicality is really when it's pouring with rain it's the last thing you want to do so we've got very few rainy pictures and uh, when it's gloriously sunshine you want to crack on and sort of enjoy it so getting the tripod out and setting the camera up and whatever else um, proved to be um, a, a romantic idea but not a very practical one um, probably the only I mean I brought a, a head torch but actually I haven't used it um, I did think about it last night when I was going to do the washing up because I've used a, a little solar light which we bought with us and just popped that on the on the back of the pack. Um, and actually that's just been enough light in the, in the tent, so probably you could have done with just one of those. And as the uh, solar light is much smaller and lighter than the head torch, I probably should have gone just for, for the one. It would have been all right. That, yeah. But having said that, if we'd have been stuck at night walking, then perhaps, perhaps the head torch would have been the better bet. Um, things that little things that always work and you just don't give a mention to are the Xbed dry uh, roll top bags. Oh, been fantastic! Absolutely when fantastic. This the weather we've had. Um, always kept our down jackets and sleeping bags absolutely spotlessly dry in our spare clothes. Um, so they've. Um, I was just looking around the tent. See, if there's anything else? No, actually. I think that's probably. Probably about it, really, of any sort of um, items to mention. The silk liners for the sleeping bags, too, are always worth their weight, keeping sort of the bag clean and uh, giving you another added um, layer of warmth, really. So they've been superb. And the bags themselves have been the RAV, Rav. Uh, 400 Quantums, which have uh, always superb. been good. Superb, love it. So um, I hope that's not uh, too much detail to uh, to bore you, but I think uh, trying to give you an idea of a few few things. But uh, basically, we kept it basically down to walking clothes, a spare set of dry clothes, um, insulation layer, some down down layer, and um, the cooking gear and a tent. And the tent's been the and ladies' and wash kit. <laughs> <laughs> of course, well, ladies for you and gents for me. Yes. Very basic. Um, but the tent's been the solar, the Terra Nova Solar 2.2. Uh, we've got the Solar 2, which is um, very impressed, very pleased with that. Um, but the Solar 2.2 has been a disappointment on a couple of fronts. Um, the interior seems to have changed, and the angle of one of the walls is actually unpleasant to, to sleep against. Um, the doors have changed their configuration, and they're actually a bit of a nuisance. They don't clip back. They're forever falling in, uh, falling in, the, in your face, as it were, when you try and sort yourself out. And the actual pole, um, clipping the poles together and putting the tent up in a rain when you're in the rush is a very precarious thing to do, particularly if there's a high wind. Um, so we're, we definitely prefer the, 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 old version. the previous version, yeah. don't we? Yeah, definitely. Much, much more comfortable. And the, um, and the competition was um, not as great a success with, with Bess as I thought it would be. So um, disappointing in some respects, but still kept us dry and warm, which is the main thing. Definitely. Home anyway. I think that brings uh, a bit of gear chat to a close, so um, we're going to have a... The rain stopped and the sun's come out. Yeah, let's go and get out and get a sun tan. Indeed. Unfortunately, um, the problem seems to be solved for now. I fought my way round the edge of the field, over a dry stone wall, and uh, negotiated quite a quantity of barbed wire fencing, but I seem to be on some kind of Land Rover track now, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, with some... A cunning studying of the map, uh, I might be able to work out where I am. So I'm going to put this little device away for now and hope that I can actually arrive either at Tarside or at Charbothy this evening. Um, and in the meantime, that's that. Actually, just noticed a very interesting um, 
sign on this fence which uh, shows a hand with uh, sparks flying off it, so that seems to indicate that it's an electric fence, and so I'd better turn this off immediately and see if I can find a, a way to get past without um, administering some sort of fatal electric shock to myself. OK, so hope to speak to you again later. Bye. So, Alistair, it's your, uh, your first crossing. Uh, and you've done it with a tarp and a 30-litre Alp kit bag. So I must congratulate you on uh, on going lightweight. Um, but has it proved to be successful? Have you had any problems? Um, no, I don't think I've had any problems. Uh, the Alp kit bag is small, and uh, it's right on the limit of getting everything in. But I have managed to get everything in there, and I haven't missed anything. Um, the tarp is a large 3x3 three three tarp which is probably a little bit too big for my needs um, and I didn't practice with it before I came away which is a mistake <laughs> but uh, I've been learning as I've been going and um, yeah I've, I've stayed out of the rain, I've stayed out of the winds and I've used a bivy bag with it, uh, just a, an Alp kit bivy bag and uh, I've been fine, yeah. Well, fair play to you for uh, for uh, learning how to pitch as you go along. So I think everybody that's spoken to you this morning have all commented on, uh, well, that's a bit of a brave thing to do because most people, I think most people when they look at a tarp get quite scared about yeah. its uh, vulnerability. But in actual fact, um, it can be quite a, a solid shelter, can't it? Yeah, it certainly can. It's uh, Even with my limited knowledge, it's uh, it stood up to the wind pretty well, actually. And uh, I, I haven't felt uh, nervous going to sleep that it's going to be ripped away from me in, in the night and not that we've had particularly strong winds but uh, yeah everything's worked really well well you said we've certainly had enough weather to test it haven't we yeah. um so just talking about gear for a short while so people can get an idea of, of what you've uh, you've taken um the uh, you, I, I was walking with you the other day and i saw you've got the sleeping mat on the obviously the outside of the uh, rucksack yeah um, along with, I think it was your jacket, and everything else is tucked inside? Yeah, everything else is inside, yeah. So what about, I mean, I think probably the most things, I mean, we've had mixed weather, and it's certainly been cold mm. at times and not freezing and miserably wet at times. Um, how have you kept warm? Uh, well, basically I've just been wearing an ordinary pair of um, Craghopper's Kiwi trousers. Um, I've got um, icebreaker tops, I've got a, a base layer, um, which is, I think, 150, they're 150. Uh, I've got a mid-layer, which is a, a sort of snug fit, which is about 260. And I've got um, another jumper, which is about 390 uh, in weight. And I've got a Featherlight, Montane Featherlight smock as well. And that with my um, Gore-Tex jacket is all I've got. Um, and using various combinations of that has uh, kept me perfectly warm. Well, you, I mean, we were cold the other day when we were crossing that top with you out of Braemar, and uh, you certainly looked, you were, you were plenty warm enough. I was yeah. quite surprised, because it's obviously lots of thin, thin layers trapping the air. Yeah, yeah it definitely works really, really well, and um, the, the merino wool stuff is just amazing. It really it really seems to suit my body, and it um, keeps me warm, warm over huge temperature ranges, so you don't get too hot or too cold. Mm. And I haven't had to keep stopping, because on a lot of backpacking trips, i found that, you know, the constant stopping and starting to change layers and things really wears you down and actually stops any sort of rhythm going. Mm. But uh, no, with, with this with this outfit, it's been fine. Yeah. Uh, talking of uh, rhythm and, and going along, and I see you're uh, wearing is it bracer boots? I see. Yeah. Yeah, bracer boots. But you've uh, got a bit of a leg or foot injury. How did you come by that? <laughs> yeah, um, I stuck my foot in a hole, which I shouldn't have done. <laughs> <laughs> And there's not a lot I can say about that, except that um, it's, it's just caused a lot of swelling. Um, and obviously that, that makes it uh, less movement in my foot, which is difficult for foot placements, etc. It's not overly painful, but um, it makes it a lot more effort to get, uh, to get across. So I've had that for now for nearly five or six days. And it's, uh, yeah starting to wear me down a little bit but uh, oh, we're almost there we're almost yeah. there presumably uh, you've you've had a, a reasonable first aid kit and so on with you um well sort of compied for the blisters and a few plasters um and a bit of ibuprofen and paracetamol and not a lot else to be quite frank um i mean i've, I've got things for being dehydrated and stuff like that, um, and sort of antiseptic wipes and just general wound care, but nothing, nothing major. 
I work on the basis that uh, I've neither got the skill nor the inclination to do anything more serious to myself. And uh, if I'm if I'm that bad, I'm going to need more uh, more assistance anyway. So yeah, I think that's uh, that's a reasonable comment. If you get into really bad deep doo doo up on the hills, then a little first aid kit's not going to help you out much. Um, on the cooking front, I see you've got the the white box stove, uh, yeah. which sits inside the honey stove, and you've got a titanium pot and a and a mug. Yeah. But with um, a thirty litre pack, I presume one of the areas that you've you've uh, probably struggled with is actually packing food. Um, and how many days worth of food have you been able to pack at any one time? Well, I've been probably three or four. Um, I've been I've got sort of half a kilo of uh, sort of luxury muesli, which um, I've been using with hot chocolate powder for my breakfast, which I, I find is a nice breakfast. Yeah, yeah. It's hot and it's uh, sweet and it uh, gives you lots of energy. Is that like a hot chocolate drink type of thing? Yeah, hot chocolate drink, oh, and okay. just pouring the pouring the powder with the muesli and pouring the hot water. And it makes a nice, uh, well, it makes a nice breakfast as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, and that that lasts uh, really well. And that's that's been my breakfast all the way across. And that that half kilo's uh, done the so job. That's a good slow energy release. That's yeah. a good good start to the day. Though. Yeah. Um, that and uh, huge amounts of cereal and chocolate bars and whatever else I can get my hands on. I've got two pouches as well, um, which I got from your good self, uh, which gone hip belt. So that adds a little bit of capacity. And I just ran that full of uh, chocolate bars and stuff, so I could keep snacking along the way. Um, but I've had about three, three to four days' food. And sort of what, what have you been eating then for the bigger meals? <laughs> Junk. <laughs> <laughs> Pub food. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Well, I've got super noodles and I've got all sorts of junk, but... Um, but yeah, you know, it's sort of couscous or rice or any, any sort of stuff like that, really. Um, with a combination of soups and and stock cubes and various other bits and bobs. I'm not really fussy about what I eat, but uh, I do make sure that whenever I get to a pub or um, any other establishment, I uh, I drink and eat at will. <laughs> and uh, I suppose the, the, the one thought is, um, uh, uh, how many nights of the, what have we had now, 10, 11 nights? 10 nights, isn't it? How many of the 10 nights have you actually used the tarp? Um, probably about four or five. Um, I've had uh, a bothy, a couple of bothies, a bunkhouse, um, a couple of B&Bs. So, yeah, sort of roughly sort of 50-50, I guess. Yeah, yeah enough time to sort of balance things out and yeah. dry out and so on. Um, I suppose one thing I haven't asked you is, just very briefly, what, what's your route been and have you been pleased with your route? Yeah, I've been quite pleased with my route, although I have adjusted it um, due to my leg injury. Um, it started at Strathcarran, uh, went through Iron Lodge, Miller Dock, um, then to Canic and Drumnod Rocket um, over the Monolias, I think that's how you say Monolias, it. Monolias, yeah. Monolias, yeah. And um, then I then I took my alternate route and went through Ben Clover. Um, well, no, sorry. Before that, uh, I went through Glen Feshy, then to Ben Clover uh, after Braemar. And now here I'm. Here I am in Tarside. And would you say, from a first-time um, visit to Scotland and a trip like this for yourself, any particular place that you thought was really beautiful, a really good high point, one something you'd like to to perhaps do again if you ever came back? Um, I can't think of anything now because you know, sort of, it's almost too fresh. Mm. Um, haven't sort of looked back on it really. Um, but I, I've just enjoyed the whole trip. Um, there, there hasn't really been a low point for me. Um, I just thoroughly enjoyed it. Mm. And it's, it's just been great. I and mean, I haven't done a high level route, um, but I, I don't particularly feel the need to. I just enjoyed walking down the glens and uh, mm. yeah, it's been good. Well, I notice that your um, your phone is also your camera and then your, also your MP3 yeah, player. That's right, yeah. So you've really sort of honed down the, the <laughs> minimalist uh, approach to things. Yeah. So for anybody listening to this, then, what advice would you pass on to them about thinking about um, cutting the weight down? Ooh, tricky one. Um, just make sure that you're really comfortable with what you're taking. Um, don't leave stuff out that you're not happy about leaving out. Because there's nothing worse than uh, sitting there cold or, or without something that uh, you're really missing. Uh, it's one thing going lightweight, but don't make yourself uncomfortable. So it's not worth doing.
Join us next time as the journey across Scotland continues on the 30th anniversary TGO Challenge 2009. Find out how easy it is to subscribe to all our free programmes. Visit our website at theoutdoorstation.co.uk or look us up on Facebook. Facebook.